and to the perpetration of liberation and political theologies. Um, she's also the editor of Two Moments of Theology. She's written over 50 articles and advised numerous dissertations. She's also on the editorial board of the Journal of Religion and has previously held similar positions at other journals and publishers. All in all, it's clear that President Trump is um, part of higher education, not only in an administrative capacity, but also as a scholar, and more importantly for this event, as a writer, interacting with writing at many stages. Please help me welcome President Trump.
good stuff would finally, in the end, come for it. I haven't always kept this discipline in writing, the discipline of writing every day, but I did learn that writing is a lot like learning to run, like learning to play the violin and other practices. Not too long ago, I read the book by Malcolm Malcolm Gladwell, the book Outliers, in which he maintains that excellence <coughs> requires 10,000 hours of practice. I think that's true for writing. So observation number three, writing may be an art, but it is most certainly a practice of discipline. So that was book one. Book number two, my Halloween book, scratchy, orange. Because of a job change, I went from the University of Chicago to Emory. Uh, once I got there, my dean and my department told me that I was going to stop teaching Latin American liberation theology, and I was going to start teaching feminist theory and feminist theology. So three years after my dissertation work, I had to change fields. I immersed myself in reading, um, in research, I spent hours in the library. I had done no work in feminist theory or feminist theology. At the same time, I underwent several very difficult personal experiences that I won't bother to recount, but that created a great deal of existential turmoil. So my internal world was being disassembled and reassembled, while my professional identity and field were also undergoing a, a dramatic change. At the same time, I discovered that I really liked the politics of American feminism, but I, but I thought it was theoretically weak. And I liked the theory of French feminism, but I couldn't stand the politics. <laughs> but I put this all together, my interior, my change in field, my view of feminism. So I was kind of jumping off an internal and external cliff of disassembling and reassembling of contradiction and creativity. I was reading theory like crazy. I was having fun teaching new material all across the university. I was trying to figure out my life in radically new ways. And since I couldn't sleep at night, I read novels, many, many novels. One day, I woke up, and a book was there. It was in my head. It was in my soul. It was in my heart. It was outlined. Over the next three days, I got the outline down on paper. And in what to me is the most amazing act of writing in my life, I wrote this book in six weeks. It took me a couple of months to edit it. It was on the edge of theory, I have to say. I think some of the reviewers thought it was on the edge of all sorts of things. <laughs> but nonetheless, it was a very different kind of experience of writing because it was something in me that had to come out. It was almost a therapeutic act, if you will. It was very healing. Observation number four. Sometimes you have to write what you need to read. Toni Morrison has noted in any number of places that she writes for herself. She writes what she needs to read. Sometimes that's true. So I'll say one thing quickly about my third book because it was yet a whole different type of writing for me. A foundation approached me to write a book about what all these women were doing in theological education. There had been a 200% increase of the number of women in about 20 years. Women were going in, but they weren't coming out as ministers. They were just going in, and nobody understood what they were doing. So a foundation offered to pay for me to travel across the country for a year, do interviews, and write their books. Write a book. They had a hypothesis. After I traveled around the country, their expense. That was great fun. I had my own hypothesis that was very different than the one they had. They were fine with that. So I wrote this book for women, for the women I spent hours interviewing who were undergoing um, some very, very radical experiences with how they understood themselves and how they understood themselves connected to um, their religious traditions and to something ultimate. I wrote this book with a group of graduate students with about 13 women, and with a few of the people I interviewed. I had lots of fun. Probably of all the books, this was the most fun because it was a collaborative project. And it was a book written for these women and others that followed them. I never thought of this as my book, though it carries my name. Observation five, sometimes you write what you hope others need to read. 
So in between those books and sets are a lot of articles and speeches. Um, some of my articles and speeches and books are works of labor. Sometimes they are revelations, though never quite the dramatic revelation that one book was. Sometimes they're collaborations. Let me share a few other observations. I always, always, always have people read my writing. I've never had much ego in my writing. I don't quite get the ego in your writing. I just want it to be as good as it can be when it gets out there. These days, Maurice Eldridge and Nancy Nicely read everything I write. And I like having the two of them because Maurice makes it more complex, unifies <laughs> it, it sounds so sophisticated. Nancy Nicely is our PR person. She makes it simple, she makes it clear. So they're very, very different situations. I collect books on writing. This has been a habit of mine since college. Uh, the Well-Tempered Sentence. Right now I'm reading one called Woe is I, probably the funniest grammar book I've ever read. I wish more of their tips would stick with me, but I think it's really important, again, to keep your craft uh, um, sharp to read the latest works. I also read a lot. I am an avid reader. I am proud to be a reader. My most fundamental identity is that I am a reader. It has been since I was a child. Read, 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 read different styles, different forms, read your favorites, go to the library. We have librarians in the back have to help you do your research. Read the books in the library and on your Kindle <laughs> or your iPad. I keep lots of files of collections of good articles on every topic I've ever researched. I have a file of best pieces I've read on that. Sometimes for fun, I try to figure out how to outline the argument or how I might structure their argument. I like to practice. Sarah asked for tips, so I have three. When you start to think of a topic or have a paper due the moment you get that, start keeping a journal. Try to think of different approaches to your argument. Start the writing juices flowing. Have fun. Take different approaches. Say crazy things in your journal. Just keep the ideas flowing. Second, here's my biggest tip. Love outlining. Outline in the beginning, before you start writing, in the middle, and the end. I love to take essays and outline them. I almost always have to move paragraphs around. Sometimes I find I have two or three or four articles. Once I outline something I'm writing, sometimes I find I don't have anything at all. I really like essays and books to have some type of logical movement. I think there's all different ways to have logical movement, but I think outlining helps you trace whether it's a circular, a linear, whatever. Okay, tip number three, when I get writer's block, I go somewhere where it is busy. A Starbucks, a food court in the mall. I work on an airplane. I write very well on airplanes. Somehow the busyness uh, helps me. I usually write in my office at home. When I get blocked, I find if I go out where there's lots and lots of people, and I concentrate somehow that on velocity. I've also tried to scrub the kitchen floor, <laughs> go first to Randomous height, do other things. I try to rearrange my exterior to shape loose my interior. So, one final question asked by Sarah. What do I wish I had known as an undergraduate? I wish I had known that writing is part art, an invention of new expression and the writing is part science, a statement with rules, facts, and theories. That is to say, I have learned over the years that one must have something to say, and you must do what it takes to say it, with accuracy and beauty to satisfy oneself and to persuade others. Writing is, I think, both art and science.
He's the author of a short guide to writing mathematics, as well as a mathematics textbook, and uh, the co-author of a high school mathematics contest problem book. He's also the author of a huge number of articles and reviews. Additionally, Professor Morrow was a writer for the CME project, an NSF-funded high school math curriculum, and a consultant for the Core Plus Math Project, a similar curriculum program. He's involved in MA publication <coughs> efforts and the editor of Notes series, which publishes on trends in teaching college mathematics. Professor Morrow is, one could easily say, an expert on writing in mathematics. Please give a warm welcome. standing up here instead of just sitting at the uh, table, which would be, I think, friendlier, but um, I wanted to actually show some things here. And I probably said, let's be good. That's ready to go. I'm not going to try to give a sort of overview of writing mathematics or science, because it's a complicated subject. Rather, I'm going to stick to some of the questions which Sarah gave us. I'll have various tips about writing mathematics as I go along, but I'm not trying to speak in any comprehensive way about it. Uh, as some of you have heard me on this before know, I like to think of mathematics as difficult to write because you have all the general issues of good writing, but you have additional issues, namely um, mathematics text is very condensed and complicated arguments, and you try to make them clear to people, and that's often hard to do, and you work hard to make that happen, but you have special techniques that aren't available in most general writing. You, as you'll see from an example, you have the technique of definition, you have the technique of inventing symbolism, you have the technique of various sorts of highlighting by labeling, etc. All these things turn out to be important for writing mathematics well and are in addition to usual rules. Now, uh, there are two questions. The very first two questions that Sarah asked us, the topics, particularly grabbed me uh, in ways that she probably wouldn't expect. One of them was what do what role do drafts and revisions play in your writing process? And the answer is immensely important. You write over and over and over again. I think most good writers in any field do that. But especially since mathematics is a difficult subject, it's difficult to understand, uh, it's particularly important. Uh, but the first question was, how has your writing process changed and developed over the course of your educational and professional career? Well, that actually, <laughs> grabbed my interest, because I think I'm probably the oldest one of the speakers, and, but probably all of us go back to the time before there were technology to help you do writing, word processors. And by the way, word processors came in, and it was a while after that before good word processors for mathematics became available, because this is what was known to um, publishers as penalty copy, copy, because they had special symbols that had to be said in various ways. So I started long before that, as you'll see from examples in a moment. Uh, I did, however, learn how to type at an early age, which was not so common at my time. And when I went to high school, only people who were planning to be secretaries to, were in the uh, vocational track took typing. But I learned at home. Uh, I got a, my dad got a book out of the library about how to learn how to type, and that turned out to be very useful. Uh, all right. so. Since mathematics was essentially difficult to create, I, I'm going to make the following comparison. Writing mathematics, at least in the old days, was a little bit like sculpting, in the sense that it was hard to get it in the right form. All right, And you better practice pretty carefully beforehand, because you don't want to mess up your actual copy. Right? I don't claim it's exactly like sculpting, but there were a lot of difficulties about getting it right, and you didn't want to write it over again. Any author who, say, had to just type an ordinary paper, when they didn't want to have to type it over again too many times because you couldn't add an extra sentence and have it flow to the next page, right? You had to type the whole thing over again, or cut and paste, literally cut and paste. So anyway, I developed a technique early on, I'm talking about early and I'll compare with now, where uh, I would try to type the final copy, but I started with thin line paper, which I, made, I vividly remember, I double spaced. I started writing by hand. I double spaced so that I had all the empty lines to fill in all the changes I wanted to make. All right? um, and I completely filled that up, and then maybe I was ready to type what I hoped would be my final copy. Um, 
Now, this was, the trouble with this process was it was so slow. I was a slow writer. I'd be halfway through a sentence and I'd say, no, that sentence isn't going to work. So I had to cross that out, start another sentence. And often it was a long time before I had my first sentence. Anyway, I went up to my attic this morning to find my old papers from high school and college, beginning of my writing career. And I have most of them, actually. But unfortunately, I have very few of the rough drafts. I do have a few of them, though. So I actually found, here's one paper where uh, I had the rough draft. And let's see how this looks. Well, I didn't double space. It seems I hadn't invented that yet. But you can see there's an awful lot of crossing out before I got around to finally having a copy I was happy with. That wasn't a math paper, by the way. That was an English paper. Um, and another one I discovered it, discovered it did a different technique. Uh, I actually typed the first copy because I did type pretty fast, but I double spaced and then I hand wrote in all the different corrections I wanted to make and then eventually made a final copy. Uh, just to show you this thought about uh, sculpting and mathematics, here's my first math paper, all right, which I did in 10th grade. And so it starts out being typed, but you couldn't do the real mathematics. You could put a few little symbols in mathematics with a regular typewriter, but whenever there was real mathematical calculations to do, I just put in a handwritten page. And by the way, there was a lot of stuff that was published. I had books by the Princeton University Press where there were handwritten symbols in the mathematics because they didn't have the right typography for it. So that's what I mean. You had to carefully figure out what you were going to put together. Uh, I'm not going to show you my uh, senior thesis from Swarthmore, but that was mathematical. And there, we actually had a secretary who had an IBM Selectric type ball, which had mathematical symbols on it. And that was a step forward, but there's still a lot that was handwritten. Here's my PhD thesis, right? which I decided to type myself, although lots of people in those days hired people to do the typing, because I wanted to understand the difficulties of spacing mathematics, uh, which was fairly complicated, so that I figured at a later time I could help other people do it for me. What it really learned was I learned that spacing was important so that when it came to the days that we had computers to work with these things, uh, I could override some of the bad decisions made by the computer programs. But uh, anyway, so here's a typical page out of my uh, thesis. Notice very widely spaced. That's actually quite important for mathematics. A lot of handwritten stuff, a lot of diagrams written, and a lot of handwritten things. What you can't see very well is there's writing on it and various places where I've marked I'm going to cross something out or I'm going to change something. And I, I didn't realize I'd forgotten this. I took my, my thesis after it was done and started rewriting it. <laughs> but the reason is, of course, as you said, we, it ended up being two or three publications. And I wanted, you always want to improve it, make it a little bit better. But anyway, my, the official copy, which is in storage in Princeton somewhere, is presumably not marked up. But uh, the copy I have is indeed marked up. Now, let me fast forward. All right, now we have computer software for doing all this sort of stuff, including writing mathematics and putting all sorts of symbols in. It is so much better, all right, because now I can make any number of copies I want, print them out, mark them up, and make changes over and over again. So I edit much more. Once you got, in the old days, once you got that copy onto what you hoped was your final page, you didn't make any more changes unless you really had to. I once really had to. There was an actual error. And I figured out with a great deal of difficulty how to get a correct sentence in the same amount of space. And I literally cut and pasted. That's where those phrases came from. I took another piece of paper, typed out the sentence, cut it with the scissors, pasted it in. But you only did that in uh, dire circumstances. Right? But now you can make changes all the time. So I added much more and much more, and keep printing out another copy, look at it, edit it again. Put it aside for a day, look at it again. The bad news is you tend to write over the same electronic file, right? You don't keep copies one, two, and three. So I don't, except in a few cases, have a situation where I have several drafts all in separate electronic files. What I really want to show you is the last thing I've written where I printed it out, written on it, and then printed it out again so you can see what sort of changes I made. Unfortunately, the last thing I wrote yesterday and the day before were solutions for the take-home test my class is doing right now. So I don't think I ought to show you the rough draft of that. So 
Uh, but that's what I do. I print things out. I print things out and then handwrite again, just as I showed you up there, some changes I want to make. And then I type them down on the computer copy and make eventually get to a final copy. Short writing for students, a little for discussions in class. Some interesting point came up and I want to discuss it a little further. Um, I'll make this a little bit bigger. I think I know how to do that. Okay. Um, we had a problem in my linear algebra class. And I'm going to explain this in a way you don't need to know any linear algebra, but I imagine some of you have taken it. You have things called matrices. There's a certain sort of matrix called lower triangular, another sort called strictly lower triangular. And we wanted to show if you had an n by n matrix, if you take the nth power of a strictly lower triangular matrix, you get all zeros. One student came up with a proof of this, which filled three blackboards with computations. It's good proof, basically, but very long. Another student came up with a solution that only filled one blackboard. Lots of computations. I thought to myself, this is great. They're really trying to do this in a careful rather than intuitive way, but there must be a better way to get at it. Even in mathematics, concepts come first, all right? And the computations are meant to elucidate and explain the concepts. So I thought of a way, this is the same thing which took three blackboards with one person, but the total amount of computation in it is these lines here, right? And again, you don't have to, oh, I'm not asking you to follow, I'm not expecting people to follow, but just to see the amount of actual equations is actually fairly small. And the amount of writing is fairly large, all right? The whole paragraph at the beginning, but it involves certain techniques that mathematicians can use. So there's the technique of defining a term. P order lower triangular is not a term that's in the literature, as far as I know. I made it up, all right? But that's something that you have the power to do. Any mathematical writer is allowed to make up terminology if it will help the cause, all right? I also made up notation for it. L sub P was the set of all P order lower triangulars. And with that notation, with those concepts, then I was able to break up the argument into three pieces. An argument that's uh, a lemma, doesn't matter here for where it was, for which there was one line that was essential for the proof and a couple of subsidiary lines, a main theorem, and then a corollary. Right? And the corollary actually had the conclusion we wanted. Right? But you have the ability to break things up into pieces like that with mathematics. And the students weren't so familiar with doing this, but I was felt I was doing collaborative work with them. They had come up with the original proofs, and I was showing how you could, in fact, uh, using the power of mathematical techniques, come up with a proof which was more conceptual and had, uh, yes, some computations, but the computations were explained by what had come previously. I have a few more of those I could show you. Um, just to say, well, I'll just do one thing here, one, two things here. Um, there were different sorts of displays in mathematics. By the way, most mathematics is written in one and a half space or something like that because it is so dense otherwise. And displays of calculations are done spread out. This is a, a left to right calculation. This is what's a several line display with reasons. There are various sorts of formats I was showing to students uh, and they each work in various ways. But th these are things which you don't have in ordinary writing which can be very powerful in mathematics. I just wanted to show you one more thing here in the way of a printout. This was not written by one of our Swarthmore students, but it could have been, actually. It's a calculus problem with a little bit of description. And uh, you'll see the point I'm getting at in a moment. To maximize it, differentiate it, then set it equal to zero, which when you solve it, it is the maximum. How many people in here have done calculus problems? And this sounds vaguely like something you did. Well, the trouble here is that in <coughs> mathematics, you're often talking about many closely related but different things. What this person meant to say is, to maximize the value of a function, differentiate the function, then set um, uh, the value of the derivative equal to 0, which when you solve that equation, the value of x which, which solves that equation leads to the maximum value of the function. It meant all those different things, <laughs> all right, which were closely related but not the same. Now, notice when I said it all in words, it got about three times as long. Fortunately, that's what mathematical notation is for. All right? To solve that, to maximize f of x, solve f prime of x, 
equals zero. So solve the equation. Let x naught be the solution. Then the maximum is f of x naught. Right? It's actually slightly shorter and correct right? as opposed to it abuse. You know, the common failing in mathematics because there's so many things which are sort of close together but not quite the same thing. All right. So there is a power in this notation. All right, let me just finish up by uh, answering some of the questions which uh, Sarah raised to us. Do I have time, Sarah? I've lost track of what I have. What do you wish you had known about the writing process when you were an undergraduate? Top-down structures. Mathematicians and scientists are certainly used to thinking you start at the beginning of an argument and you go to the end of the argument. And certainly the logic has to come out that way. But if you simply start and it's a long argument and you go to the end, you're going to lose everybody along the way. All right? You've got to tell them where you're heading at various different stages and put road markers along the way. There are techniques within mathematical <coughs> writing for doing that. I mean, partly it's just ordinary writing. It's saying at the beginning where you're going. But there's also sectioning. There's labeling of key equations. There's labeling of sections. All this sort of stuff. I, I look at my early writing and it was too discursive to be good mathematical writing. Now it's broken into chunks more. And I wish I'd understood the importance of that uh, for the sort of writing I do at an early time. Uh, what are your favorite and least favorite parts of the writing process? Oh, now that we have computers, it's much easier for me to get the first draft down because I type and type and type and type and I already have a paragraph down before I decide that was a bad approach. But then I can edit it, right, and make it better. Whereas before, I got stuck in the middle of the first sentence, so that's not good. What do I do next? All right. So my favorite part is the fine editing after I've gotten the first draft. The hardest part is getting the first draft, but it's a lot easier now than it was in the old days. Right. Um, other things I don't like are when I have very tight limits on how much space, uh, how many words I'm allowed to write. Uh, I don't just do mathematical writing. I happen to be a train fan, and I just came back from riding the high-speed trains in Spain, and I'm going to write an article for the Delaware Valley Association of Rail Passengers newsletter, but they said I have 500 words. Well, I'm going to have to work hard to get an article that says what I want to say in that amount of space. The other thing that's hard is if I have a really complicated topic and I've got to make it clear, and I don't see yet how to make it clear. That's frustrating. That's when I get closest to writer's block. But deadlines are great for that. So you get something on paper, and then you can work on it. And in the meantime, the way I work well with writer's block is I do something else that hasn't gotten done in the meantime. I do a whole bunch of those other things. Clean up the house, whatever. So that at least some other things I've done, and then I get around to the work that I need. Is it important to you to get feedback on your writing from experts or with those unacquainted with the topic? Depends who I'm writing for. If I'm writing a journal article for a research journal, obviously I want feedback from experts. If I'm writing something, as I often do these days for students, to try to clarify a point that came out in class, I want feedback from non-experts. because I want to make sure that what I say is helpful to them. Uh, to what extent is writing a collaborative process for you? Depends. Some things get written entirely by myself. Some things are collaborative in odd ways, such as this thing I showed you before. My main textbook, I collaborated with a friend who was in London while I was here. And we did it all back and forth uh, electronically over a period of several years. We each disagree with each other all the time. And so we wrote and rewrote and rewrote. But uh, it depends on the particular circumstance. Anyway, I've gone on long enough. Uh, I appreciate your inviting somebody to talk about a, a somewhat uh, uh, scientific form of writing. I hope you found it
things on his CV that you can tell are in progress and at various stages. Um, he's also worked with many students writing as a thesis advisor. Please welcome Professor Eric Um, 
Well, obviously, one thing is practice. You've got to write. You've got to write 10,000 narratives. You know, I know the under, this fellow was an undergraduate when I was a graduate student at Stanford, the fellow who came up with that, that piece of wisdom that, that Malcolm Gladwell cites in his, uh, in his text. Um, and I think there is something to that. You've just got to get, you've got to practice. You've got to write a lot. You've got to get a lot of feedback. It's not always going to be fun, but that's the way you get better. You also have to read. You've got to read good writers. No substitute. You can't just read Facebook if you want to learn how to write. It's not writing that. It's got to be subtracted. Of course, it's here as well. Um, I love to collaborate of the, uh, I'd like to say many, but of the publications I have, uh, I think only one is single author. Um, and that was actually something online, electronic publication. Everything else I've ever written is with other people, which I need because um, I'm always the worrier of the pair. So I, I have to work with someone who said, Andrew, it's going to be fine. You know, we're going to hit the deadline, not a problem. And Andrew stopped revising, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, in terms of collaboration, I would say writing is like a good conversation or a tennis match. It's best done with someone who's a little better than you. And I've had that experience many times. I've had the privilege of writing with um, my graduate mentors. Just recently, we, we published this, actually not the whole thing, just the first chapter uh, of this, this uh, text that just came out, the Handbook of Social Psychology. I love what they call them handbooks, and they're, you know, one hand can bear all <laughs> Endeavor, uh, 300 references, and uh, it took us quite a while. Uh, it took us about six months, and, and we did more than a few drafts. That's a thing we've heard over and over again. You've got to, you've got to revise. But let me ask you: Some of you already know this, so don't raise your hand because you already heard. How many drafts do you think we might have written of this? Do you think we wrote 10, 20, or 30? How many of you think 10 drafts? Thanks. Thanks for playing along. 20 drafts. 30 drafts. How many think we? You're all wrong. We wrote 105 drafts. 105 drafts to get this right. And it's still not done. That's why I love when students say, well, I wrote this last night. I think it's fine. Yeah, I love that. Now, <laughs> we didn't have the final version of the first draft. Let me be clear. We were adding and changing and making lots of corrections and additions. But you know, you've you, you got to take the time to revise. And you need that time. The easiest way to quash creativity is to give someone a, a really strict deadline, like tomorrow. That's a good way to prevent people from being creative. So psychology research has shown us that. And we also know from how, the, from the way the mind works, that you need time in between the revisions. You've got to take a break, and then you've got to come back to the material. You've got to unlock the process in a way that you can't do if you're just at it straight. Even when Rebecca was writing three times a day, you notice there were some breaks in between, where she built a house and you know. <laughs> Faceplate of the bubble. Faceplate. What a wonderful <laughs> one. 
I'd be there to hold that doohickey and then pull out this thing. And she'd be like, I couldn't explain it. I didn't love that. <laughs> Sarah also asked, what's the, our, our favorite writing to write? Or what's our favorite kind of writing? And, and, and for me, I have to say, it probably was the wedding book, even though I, you know, I felt like a charlatan. Well, I always feel like a charlatan, because I, I, I've never been married. But um, I was writing about uh, weddings with my, my co-author, who had just gotten married and was teaching negotiation. It was a natural project for her, and she asked me to write it with her, and I said, well, I will, but my only contribution is going to be to add the jokes. Right? That'll be my contribution. <laughs> it wasn't quite true, but the thing I liked so much about it is it was very free. You know, academic writing, especially in certain fields, is really constrained. Now, that can be helpful. That can give you a guideline. You know how many words you have to write, but it can also feel a little confining in terms of being able to express yourself and, and being free form, or as my colleague Barry Schwartz described the writing in the winning book, as breezy. <laughs> I'm sort of being breezy for once in my career. But I have to say, I think I like word limits because I love cutting too. I mean, we've talked about the, the process of hacking. Oh, I love it. I love getting it down to the absolute bare minimum where it's just crystal clear and there isn't one excessive word. I think I got this from my dad, who's very good at it. He said he learned it from writing postcards because you know you had a very limited space with which to write. You had to get your message across with no extra verbiage. And so I um, and the only, the only other piece I'll say that in terms of what I, I, I like writing is um, you haven't lived until you've read a recommendation letter written by Matt Anderson. <laughs> She's a poet, right? And talk about someone who knows how to use language in just, yeah, some people have, written, have read some of her, her letters. And boy, somebody with that command of language and to be able to write so beautifully and, and, just, and just crystallize thoughts that you have that you could never express, uh, I think. Well, that's one of the rare pleasures in life. So hopefully you'll have that pleasure someday or something similar. Anyway, I'll take care of that time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I'll start by saying I, I remember reading a guide to writing by a very successful writer who said you should never revise on the, the computer itself. He said you should print it out and then you should make changes by hand because it was too easy to be lulled by the, so the formal appearance of computer text to think, oh, this is just fine the way it is. I think that's even changed now. I think I've gotten better at realizing I'm going to have to revise as I'm typing or soon after. I even for the first time had students submit papers electronically to me last year. And I wasn't sure how it was going to work because I was going to be typing in comments as I was going. But I discovered it worked pretty well now. So I think we're all kind of getting used to this new technology. And with practice, I think it can work pretty well. Yeah, I, I think um, over my lifetime, I've had to make the shift from pen to paper to computer. I got my first computer um, as I was submitting my dissertation. So I wrote my dissertation out longhand. I then typed it and then typed it into a computer only to have the University of Chicago reject it because they weren't rejecting, uh, they weren't accepting uh, computerized <laughs> dissertations. So I had to then pay someone <laughs> oh, uh, to do it. But over the years, it's gotten progressively easier for me to um, write. But you know, I was talking about how I love to outline. I still outline by hand. 
that, and I, I do outline, I do journaling by hand, and I love to, um, I also like keep, I don't know, keep kind of a diary of thoughts and ideas, and I do that by hand. So I can, I can sit down and write an article totally on the computer, but the outlining and the filler often comes by hand. I guess I would say whatever is comfortable for you, you should do, yeah. right? Uh, I write more slowly than I type, and that's been true ever since eighth grade when I taught myself how to type. Uh, and so that part of it was very comfortable with me. Uh, I do still almost always revise on paper. Uh, I, I'm old-fashioned enough. I don't want to read anything on a computer that's older than about two pages. So I'll both read and revise. But uh, I, I revise sometimes on a computer. You just develop, again, you should be comfortable when writing and you should do whatever feels best for you. It is true that more and more people are using computers more and more of the time. When I started uh, doing writing courses in mathematics, I told my students it takes a while to learn the mathematical software for doing mathematical writing. Feel free to just type the regular words and write the math in by hand. I told them, leave up more space than you expect because you'll need more space. And that was what most of them wanted to do for a number of years. Now most students, many students, come to Swarthmore already knowing how to do basic mathematical computer writing. And so I, I see less and less of that. But again, you should be comfortable. Yes. Um, so I think it's Professor Ward who mentioned how constrained academic writing can be. Um, and I think that's especially visible in scientific disciplines, but it's also certainly true in the humanities and <coughs> sciences. And I'm interested in what you as researchers and academic writers do to make your writing creative and your within the constraints placed on you by your respective disciplines. So the, the question is, how do we make our writing creative within the constraints of academic disciplines, given that there are some pretty strict guidelines for lots of academic writing? And I'll just say, I kind of push the boundaries sometimes. So if, if you look at my acknowledgment sections, for example, I'll throw in a joke. Um, one time I was doing work on a, a phenomenon I, I called negative acknowledgment. That's what we called the phenomenon. So in the acknowledgments, I wrote in parentheses, non-negative acknowledgments. And I wasn't sure that the uh, editor would let me get away with it. But I think academics recognize that although they're stuck with it, they'd love to see some pushing of the boundaries of it. And so if you can do even little things to make, it's sort of distinguish your writing within, even within those constraints, I think people generally appreciate that. Um, so I've always wanted to write a book where I did all the footnotes first <laughs> and then write the text. Because <laughs> in my discipline, that would make utter sense. I, I think some of my colleagues write that way. <laughs> and the more, the more footnotes, the better. And, uh, so, uh, in, um, serving as an administrator, I really have had to learn to write to a broader audience, and it's not, uh, it's not been very easy. I've had to learn to write without footnotes, without lots of quotations, without, you know, so-and-so said this, so-and-so said that. So, so it feels like I've had to learn to write in a plainer, more direct voice. Um, and I've, I've done that by just finding models uh, to read. I, I, I really like the Transcendentalist and, and Whitman and Emerson and those people. I, I, I think they write very uh, plainly and clearly, so I keep going back to them. So I find myself um, reading those people a lot. So first, just an interesting fact, uh, academic writing in mathematics has no footnotes, except the one footnote at the bottom of the front page where you say what your funding was. Uh, and there's, there's actually a historical explanation for why that that's the case. And we never quote anybody. Right? So, but, but that's certainly the style in other fields. And by the way, in my writing book, I talk about why we have these differences. The, the main constraint in scientific writing is that usually they're page restrictions because it's still, it's still expensive to print these uh, journals. Uh, now with online journals, that, that isn't so, they don't have that problem traditional journals too. So I guess I tend to regard it a little bit like restrictions of a haiku. It's not a haiku, but the point is you have certain, you're being tested, can, can you fit in certain constraints? And all right, so you make your arguments as elegant to make them terse as you can, all right? And uh, you maybe state peripheral results without proving them or something. There are various things you can do. 
Um, but, uh, and that makes it, a, you can think it's a little bit of a challenge that way. Uh, certainly mathematicians have a sense of humor, and I've seen articles with jokes in them. And so I, I think you know, having to be straightforward and, and dull is not in fact the case. Um, the other thing, uh, I'd like to second what uh, President Chapa said. As an academic, you don't just do research writing in your field. I mean, you do expository writing, which is generally has more uh, uh, breadth of what you do. And you do things within your academic community. Uh, I was the chief author, author of the intellectual policy, uh, of the intellectual property policy of the college. And by the way, that went through, I think, about 105 revisions, <laughs> too. Uh, but that was a different sort of writing. Uh, I, uh, I do on Friday, I have to write the document for my department arguing that why we should have another tenure track position. Well, that's, uh, that'll be a nice challenge. You know, I got a week's reprieve for getting out of I should say, I already got mine in. <laughs> I, no, you were on time. I'm late. Okay. I, was, I was given an extension. Uh, uh, but, but there's an argument you're trying to be, you're trying to be uh, uh, persuasive, but it's not writing in the style of your discipline. So in fact, any academic writes a whole bunch of different styles, and that gives you a sort of breadth. But as long as we're on this topic, I, I, I don't know how you all feel, but the older I get, I, I get more concerned about this um, style we have in academic writing. And I think it's really been hard for the humanities. I think it's really hurt the humanities. I don't know about your division. But I think it has made much of what we've written relatively inaccessible. And it's taken away our public voice. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure we can get out of it. I've had friends, a good friend of mine is very concerned about this too. And she's taken creative fiction classes. She's tried to write novels. But when she goes to write on theology, it's back to the, you know, very pedantic almost. So I, I think it's a, it is a concern, and I, and I hope some of you who go on to become humanists and teach in future generations and write in future generations, generations can write more accessible texts. Um, you know, in the 50s and 60s, people in my field, like H. Richard Niebuhr, Paul Tilla, Grant Niebuhr, were some of the leading thinkers in the day. People were reading them about politics, about culture, about art. It didn't matter that they were somehow theologians. Nobody cared about that. These people had something to say. Now they have no one to read, uh, a, 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 any humanist. I mean, they wouldn't be on the front of Times or Newsweek like they used to be. So I, I think the issue you point to is a real failure of the humanities to, to learn how to speak to a broader So when you're um, giving things to other people to uh, read, do you, do you give it to them um, after it's all done? Or do you think, let's say I have three people who I want to show this to. Do you think it's better to show one person it when I'm only in the beginning and say, is this going in the right direction? And then another person when I'm almost done and then another after I think it's complete or finish it and then give it to everyone? Or how do you determine when to give it to people? And second on that issue, when you give it to someone to read, do you, I think it's good to tell them specific types of things you want them to pay attention to, or is it better to just let them have it and do with it what they will? Well, I'll start on this one. Kind of all of the above. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it kind of depends. I, I try not to insult somebody I'm reading by sending them something that's gibberish. I mean, I try at least to to make it really worthy of their time, because it takes time, uh, a lot of time, to make comments on another person's read, writing. Sometimes I will Sometimes I will send something to somebody, and I will just say, does this make any sense at all? Or I'll send something, should I keep going on this? You know, but even then, I think it's good enough. Um, I, I have I have learned that you can't, you can send it out to about two or three people at once, but more than that, it just gets too confusing. So I think you do have to kind of time the people, uh, time, time when you send it. I, I don't tend to ask people specific things. 
I just tend to send it. And sometimes I will ask people to not to worry, not not worry too much about the grammar or anything. Just kind of give me ideas. But Connie Hungerford, the provost, if you ever, she's a beautiful writer. She's a wonderful writer. If you ever send it to her, it's so cool because she cannot get through a sentence without correcting every <laughs> grammatical thing. So I can't overuse anything to her, but I really like it when I send it because it's like perfect. So you kind of, I guess, have to also know the person you're sending to it to, because you know, again, I don't want to waste Connie's time having to edit all my weak grammar, but sometimes it's important. So I'll take over from there. Uh, it was mentioned one of my roles is I'm uh, the editor in chief of the one of the um, uh, publication series of the Mathematical Association of America. So we have a number of documents coming to us. We have, I have a committee to do reviews. Uh, and I tell authors who are uh, who want to submit a manuscript, uh, go over it at least once. Don't, say, don't give us gibberish. On the other hand, don't have it in the form that you consider to be perfect when you send it. Because 10 members of our board are going to go over it and ask for all sorts of changes. And if you already think it's perfect, you're going to be very uncomfortable <laughs> getting our reviews. Some sort of middling state. Is, is the right sort of stage. Uh, generally, when I ask people to look at my own things, I don't, I, I don't try to lead the witness. I let them comment on what they want. But sometimes there is something particular I, I, I want to have an opinion about, and I'll, I'll let them know. I'll tell you one more story. I, I, I showed you a copy of my uh, PhD thesis, but I didn't tell you the following story. I wrote my first draft, or first draft of about three quarters of it, and gave it to my thesis advisor to look at. And a week later, I met with him, and he said, well, you wrote it in the order A, B, C. I think it would be much better in the order C, B, A. <laughs> and basically, you wrote in the order in which you discovered things. I mean, that's true. I was sort of, uh, here's what I thought about first, here's what I thought about second. But that's not the right order for people, other people to understand it well. You really ought to start with the general thing you got to, and then do specific things. So in fact, I completely rewrote the first 80 or 90 pages. Right? Uh, it was sort of a rude shock to me that he said that, but I came to understand that he was right. But it is true, well, while it was a rude shock, I wasn't expecting I had a perfect thing that I gave him. I gave it, gave it to him at a stage where I was looking for a bunch of advice. You know, that's interesting. In that same piece that I referenced earlier of this recommendations on good writing from this very fine psychologist, he, he recommends when you're writing up a psychology study, you write the study that it ended up being, not the one that it started out, when you were first thinking of the ideas. The reader is not helped by that. They want to see how you're describing the product that is now before them. But then I think the most important thing is you're giving it to other people to read. F point 14 on my 14 point <laughs> memo was you've got to have other people read it. If there's nobody around, read it aloud. I mean, you've got to have that kind of feedback. And I also said that you don't, nor should, should you always have to follow a reader's advice about how to fix a problem, but you should take seriously the fact that he or she came across a problem in your writing. Because I think all of us are pretty good at noticing there's something wrong here. I'm not sure how to fix it, but this isn't flowing. And then it may be up incumbent on you as the writer to, to figure out how to fix it, but at least getting that feedback is so critical. <laughs> I'm amazed. At, you know, I'll sit with a student who's turned something. I, I realize I'm telling all these horror stories, but most of the time it, things work fine. But I'll sit with a student and I'll just read the first sentence aloud. And it's very clear to both of us that, well, that's not working at all. And, and I just think if someone had read that, you know, maybe it was written five minutes before I, I got to it, and that's why. But you, you would see the problem. 